Hey, 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 guys. Welcome to Building This Community. This is your city business and policy development podcast. We're your hosts, Luke Patrick and Andrew Klump. Welcome to this week's episode of Building This Community. Our guest today is Dr. Ted Smith, who is the an associate professor of environmental medicine at the University of Louisville, as well as the director for the Center for Healthy Air, Water, and Soil uh, of the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville, and a former chief innovation officer with Metro Louisville government. Ted, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for joining us today. I know I just gave uh, almost, almost a mouthful of, of your background here, but can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, you know, sort of relevant to our conversation today, um, you know, I, I adopted Louisville as my new home, you know, or, you know around 2000 and um, have exercised my uh, love for our community in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, first working for Mayor Fisher in his first uh, term and a half uh, as the city's first chief innovation officer, which was uh, just a really wonderful opportunity to, to get to know the, the many challenges and probably more importantly, the opportunities uh, in our community for you know, really doing great things. And uh, over time through that role, uh, really got involved in some work that was looking at the environmental determinants of health and well-being. And, you know, that really became a passion of mine, ultimately creating this um, new research organization at the University of Louisville called the Envirome Institute. Um, it's it's also hard to say. So if you like the genome, you'll love the Envirome. It's the counterpart. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, and it have been at the University of Louisville in the School of Medicine with this new research entity for, for the last uh, three years. Well, that's a really impressive resume. But I think the main thing we wanted to talk about, the reason we had you on today was uh, the Greenheart Louisville study. So can you start by telling everybody uh, what the study is and what specifically your role in that project is? So we think of the Greenheart Louisville project as kind of a flagship emblematic project for, for what we mean when we say, you know, the environment is a is a big determinant of your overall health. And, you know, this work actually has some very deep roots back to my time uh, working with the mayor, where we were looking at air pollution in Louisville. And, you know, Louisville has a, a very long history um, with uh, different kinds of air pollution problems. And um, while much of that has, has gotten significantly better since uh, decades ago, um, you know, we, we're learning about the, the real health consequences of even small amounts of uh, sort of newly discovered forms of air pollution. And so it's a, it's a moving target. And when you look at Louisville and you see the <clears throat> challenges we have with air pollution, you know, you, you can sort of get um, uh, hopeless about it. And you can say, well, what can I do about all the air? And, you know, isn't that the EPA's job? Or don't we need the jobs in the industry and transportation? I mean, all that's true. But, um, you know, what we came up with was kind of a local intervention, which is designed entirely in the hopes that it will remove air pollution. And that is uh, vegetation. And so we have a, call it a six year clinical trial to demonstrate whether increasing vegetation in a city uh, can re reduce air pollution and, um, and therefore also reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very big and complicated uh, project and it's the first of its kind in the world at this scale. So we're talking about four neighborhoods in South Louisville, home to about 22,000 people. And it's a controlled trial, <clears throat> meaning, you know, there's a group that's getting greening and there's a group that's not getting greening. And, um, you know, it's a very rigorous scientific study. Um, we're looking at endpoints that the drug trials use. You know, we're looking at um, vascular stiffness and a whole host of markers in the cardiovascular system for, for health and disease development. So, um, it's pretty exciting, I guess I would just say. So um, we're kind of in the first third of that project. Um, we're at baseline. 
uh, kind of data collection, you know, trying to figure out how healthy everybody is, how much air pollution there is. Um, we start aggressive planting, you know, in about eight months, and that'll take about a year and a half of planting mature trees and bushes, so 20, 30 foot trees, um, you know, to the tune of about eight or uh, eight or nine thousand of those uh, in a short period of time. So it's it's truly uh, an ambitious activity. And it's really designed to remove air pollution in hopes that it will reduce disease risk. Well, uh, that sounds incredible. You know, anybody that listens to the show knows we care a lot about green space around our city, around Louisville. I, um, I, it's surprising to hear the scale of this project, you know, just looking at the website and trying to understand, you know, better what you guys were trying to do. I think it was maybe hard for me to picture it being conducted uh, with you know so many people involved in, in uh, on such a large scale uh can you maybe explain what makes this study unique from other neighborhood health studies that you, you know yeah. we see taking place sure that's a great question you know so there are lots of published studies that we call correlational studies you know meaning that they've established there's an association between one thing and another thing and so there is a long standing literature that says Hey, you know, people that generally live close to green spaces or close to vegetation just generally have much better health outcomes. Then you learn about statistical techniques, you know, to try to handle the objections, right? So wealthier people live near green spaces. So, you know, how do we adjust for wealth and make sure that we're not really just measuring wealth and not the effect of greenness? And, you know, you, you get into a lot of um, the statistical juggling that I think the average person and certainly even the sophisticated policymaker starts rolling their eyes, right? You know, because if you can't establish cause, it's very difficult to um, to take action, okay? I mean, it can be done, and, and it has been done you know, over the years, but um, it's the gold standard is establishing cause. And the only really uh, known way that science has to offer for us uh, to do that is an interventional controlled trial ideally a randomized trial, right? Where in this case, if we could, if we assign people where they live randomly and then planted things in some areas and not others, much like our pandemic drug trials work, right? That'd be ideal. We can't do that. So the next best thing is a, is a match control trial, meaning you do your best to create a place that is statistically as nearly identical as possible to another place. And then you put the intervention in one of the places. And then you see uh, how each group does over time. And so uh, if the only thing we change is the amount of greenery, then you are one step closer to making the statement that greenery causes this reduction in risk. And, and that word cause is, is a pretty important word. And it, uh, it changes the table stakes, if you will, for the whole conversation. So uh, you said there, you talked just about the need to create a control group. And is all of that taking place within the city of Louisville or are you comparing it yeah. to somewhere? Okay, okay. No, all um, that's within the same neighborhoods, actually. And, okay, perfect. And, and just like the conversation about things like vaccines, um, you know, we, we go into this with uh, what is called an intent to treat, meaning, you know, if this works, if it, if it confers a health benefit, our intention would be to offer this planting to that control group. Um, you know, so that we're really not doing anything that seems um, unfair in some sense. So w what is exactly the scope of this? Does it go and extend to something such as like noise pollution? Because I know, in, at least in Auburn Park, you know, we have a lot of greenery, but we have airplanes, we have a train, we have a highway all right outside our neighborhood. And so I, I'm just curious if this study takes on any of those externalities or if Absolutely. it's just specifically on greenery? No, no, no. So so because our our primary hypothesis is that um, the, the reason that greenery confers this health advantage is likely because of its improvement in air quality. And so we are we are measuring air pollution at a very, very fine uh, level of granularity in these four neighborhoods and have been doing that for the last two years. It's a, it's probably the most highly characterized set of neighborhoods in America. Um, so, so we know how much air pollution is. And to your point, there are other factors that are known to also create cardiovascular disease risk and noise pollution is one of those. And so 
uh, mostly as an insurance policy on our findings. You know, we are measuring noise. It's, um, you know, these neighborhoods straddle the Waterson Expressway. Uh, it's near the airport. Uh, so, and there's rail yards, you know, not far away. So, so there's plenty of um, focused uh, ambient noise opportunity. And um, so that that's part of it. And actually we've had, uh, we were loaned some very, very expensive air monitors from the FAA um, uh, last year. And um, these are the, these are the air monitors they use to determine the noise footprints around airports. And so we were able to deploy those four of those in the study area, and that'll be helpful. It also help us understand whether vegetation can reduce noise, right? So we'll know what role noise plays, hopefully, and we'll know whether vegetation has anything to do with noise or specific sources of noise like road traffic versus air traffic. You know, you might expect that uh, vegetation might be able to suppress uh, road noise, but m might be a, a bigger order to uh, suppress air aviation noise. Right? Uh, so, uh, so you've talked a little bit about. Uh, you said you've got four neighborhoods selected here in the city. Uh, is is there something about Louisville, some characteristic of of the city, uh, what makes it what made it stand out for you all to conduct your study in, or is it simply that that you guys mostly live and, and work here? <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. Um, we we certainly could have done this, uh, you know, in dozens and dozens of cities in America or hundreds across the world. Um, we, we chose, uh, you know, to work here because, you know, work like this, you know, is really at its best if it's, um, you know, sort of with the community. Right. And so if you think about, you know, some of the most famous researchers in the world, you know, they're at Ivy league schools, they fly to developing countries, they do research. And, um, you know, I mean, some of it is obviously very, it's all very well intentioned, but, you know, these are visitors to communities, right? And, um, you know, sometimes people use the term extractive research, you know, like extractive energy, you know, we, you visit, you get your data, you go back, you know, you get your grants, you get your papers. Um, and, you know, I think fundamentally there's a, there's a better way to do urban research. And, you know, it's important to us that we're, we're also in the laboratory, you know, with the people that we're working with. I live here. I love this city. Uh, I, you know, I hope that the findings of this work are first applied here broadly across our city. And, um, so I think it's important that we're uh, that we're working here. So some of it you could call it convenience, but I think it's a much more important concept, which is, you know, we have a research university here in our backyard in Louisville, and um, that's a special thing for our community. And this is one way that we demonstrate that it's special. And so I, we maybe hit on this a little bit earlier when, when Andrew brought up, you know, noise pollution and all the other factors that you guys are monitoring. But uh, what about the mental health component? Is that something you guys are focusing on when you're trying to get this baseline community wellness? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so you can guess that if you say I'm going to reduce cardiovascular disease risk, you're going to have a date with all the other things that are known to be associated with cardiovascular disease. And so... Um, we, we need to be careful as, I mean, it's impossible, to, you know, to, to uh, make sure you're measuring everything, right? But it's it's important that we keep track of things that we know are associated with, with cardiovascular disease. We know that depression is associated with cardiovascular disease. We know that exercise is associated with cardiovascular disease. We know that social cohesion is associated. We know that stress is, a, right? so we can go on a long list of things, right? And so um, if the vegetation was actually acting directly on one of those other things, right? So there's certainly one working theory is green spaces encourage people to come out, to be outside and exercise and get more sunlight and all those kinds of things. And so um, we said it was air pollution, but what if it was really uh, people coming outside? You know, compared to their life before all the vegetation. And so we, uh, we, we do have a whole series of measures that we're trying to keep track of in parallel so that we can then look at this at the end and say, you know, what is the contribution of uh, stress? What is the contribution of social cohesion? What's the contribution of out being outdoors? And so we are measuring all those things and we're doing it, you know, quite selfishly to make sure that we're making the right attribution. You know, so did the greenness cause air pollution reduction as its primary benefit or was there a, a larger benefit to some other social factor or environmental factor? Is this 
green space simply expanding the tree canopy because you know we had a guest on with with Prees Louisville who is involved with your project a little bit yep. but or or is this beyond just a tree canopy and adding actual green space you know adding parks adding depth rather than just canopy sure. coverage that's a great question um so it's definitely not a tree project right so we we often get invited to speak to other cities other universities about the project and um it is often you know introduced as louisville has a, has a big tree project going on a tree research project and um while trees are absolutely um, central actors in this because they are such an efficient and aggressive <laughs> type of vegetation it is not a tree project so so let me let me just say the highlights of where the health benefits come from there's a lot more literature that says you living close to greenery of any type is more beneficial than you living close to a tree Okay, so that it's important to know that because we want to make sure that we're working on the right intervention. So the intervention is introducing greenness as close to you as possible. And sometimes this gets the parks people upset, but the evidence is living uh, as close to greenness is the is the important factor. Right. So if you have a park uh, 200 yards away, that's not as beneficial as having vegetation in your backyard. Right, and right. so, you know, you can get into we, nobody wants to get into any sort of wars about this, but, um, you know, I'm just telling you what the literature says. The literature says the benefit. It's a dose response curve that the closer the greenness is, the more benefit you get, you know, literally down to meters away from where you live. And arguably for some people, it's vegetation in your home. Um, you know, that's a little more controversial, but, you know, there's certainly a, a bunch of folks that are you know, really trying to explore that. So. To be, to be clear here, so this you, you talked about how, it, how adding green space provides a cleaner air environment and everything like that. But there's also been research that's kind of proven that, you know, for example, with, with climate change, we can't plant ourselves out of climate change, right? <laughs> that trees cannot match the amount of carbon that's being produced in the air. Does, right. does that mean that, that the, the green spaces that are being implemented can only have a certain degree of effect in those neighborhoods and that there has to be some sort of greater societal change in order to have a greater impact on those neighborhoods? Or I, I guess my, I'm asking, what is the kind of, is there a cap sure. on this study? Yeah, I mean, um, surely there is. And now we're having a theoretical conversation, but um, okay. surely there is a cap. <laughs> um, you know, I think if we go back to how we started this conversation, the reason the project began was born out of this idea that I wonder if we can do something uh, to improve our own local environment, right? Or are we st are just at the behest of larger global forces, right? Federal policies, global. And and so while it would be true, you can go make the argument that you know changing global behavior, national behavior is absolutely important. It's unfortunate if that's the only idea that we have, right? right. right. So, and so I think it's a mistake to say, well, you know, uh, how much benefit can you really get from this vegetation? What we really need to do is change our energy mix in this country. Like, well, you know, I, I mean, I think for every day that somebody lives in environments that have these exposures, um, you know, that's a pretty awful sentence that you're giving somebody. I mean, these effects yeah. are both <laughs> acute and chronic. And so, while we should be striving to improve our overall global environment on our global ecology, I think there's no excuse, you know, for not acting uh, locally when you can. I think that that makes perfect sense. And I'm glad for the clarity there. The other thing that I think is also important, and it's a kind of structure that I harp on consistently uh, on our podcast, which is accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. Yep. How is this project more neighborhood creation and allowing people to have these parks immediately to their immediately accessible to them? Or is it also, hey, we need to have public transit so that these people in this neighborhood can get to the park that's closer to them, that can get to one that instead of it being 15 minutes away, it's it's five minutes away because they have better public transport. Uh, how how does accessibility play a role into that? 
So, so I'll go back to the, the bigger organizing principle is <clears throat> how can I get nature as close to you and where you live as possible? Okay, so, so I think rather than saying how accessible is a park to you, the, the question is what's going on with the public right away outside of your house? Okay, there's many, 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 many more miles of public right of way than there is available park space for most urban communities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do nothing with those rights of way <laughs> in the name of health. Right. Other than I mean, we do safety. Safety is a slightly different concept. Um, but but you know, that's the challenge for us is um, when we laid when we do urban planning, we say, well, wh wh what should the city have in it? how should things be arranged you know these think of them these are very structural policy decisions right and they have very long-standing consequences we a long time ago devalued everyday nature a long time ago and and the thing that we cling to you know is Olmstead, and we cling to this idea of like well let's have a little bit of nature in the city and we'll call it a park i mean i'm all for that but not uh not at disregarding the importance of all the other spaces Right. Mm -hmm. So it, this is really about everybody waking up to, you know, our, our idea of what a city is and, and how much nature should be in a city. And, you know, our, you know, I think our, our guiding principle is probably a lot more nature than you think. I mean, we actually one part of the Green Heart Project is a aggressive biodiversity assessment where we're counting bugs, birds and bats at 100 locations in the study area. You know, because, you know, really getting an understanding of how diminished our ecology is, you know, is important. You know, a lot of times when cities were first formed, you know, everybody's trying to get away from the, the scary wilderness, right? And all the awful critters and, the, you know, right? I mean, just it's so terrifying out there in the wilderness, it'll kill you, right? Um, and now I think maybe we're coming to the conclusion that lack of wilderness might kill you, right? And so we have to have a rational approach to getting nature back into cities. Um, I'm all for parks. I'm all for accessibility parks. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if you say that's the most important thing and we know that every day of the week you live in a place that is barren, getting on a bus to go to a park is not going to solve your everyday exposure problem. Well, I think I can understand that. And I mean, intuitively, it just kind of makes sense. But I, I wanted to harken back to something you mentioned earlier that you or, or maybe members of your team have been invited to speak at other universities, other cities. Do, can I take that to mean that there's interest from other cities in, in this work that you're doing? Well, there's an, an unbelievable amount of interest in other cities. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if many cities around the world, um, you know, have embarked on their own versions of trying to introduce more nature. A lot of it is focused on trees. Some of it is focused on parks. Um, and, and these are always... Um, expensive, you know, I think it's thinking of it as like bottomless, you know, pits of, you know, work, right, where there's never enough money for, you know, given the goals that, that people have set for their communities. Um, so we are often a refreshing um, perspective because we're coming at it from health, right? We're not coming at it from aesthetics, you know, like well, how much nature should be in a city to have a pretty city, right? I mean, that's not our perspective. Our perspective is basic biology. And um, if I could demonstrate to you that uh, having a, uh, a more significant mix of nature in your city could um, obviate the need for some pharmaceutical products at some point in time, that'd be a pretty wonderful conversation to have. We have a highly medicated society. I wonder how much of these medications are because of the way we designed our cities. Absolutely. I mean, I think we all love to get answers to questions like that. But can I take that to mean you said that there's all this interest? Are there is there any desire to maybe replicate the study in in other areas? Yeah. So the the it's a great question. So the number one issue for replication is money. So um, to pull this project together, it's a really it's a fun story. But the quick version of it is the reason that studies like this aren't done more regularly. Uh, is because to bring together, think of it as $15 million-ish as a target number, um, you know, to, to bring $15 million together to answer a question, uh, it turns out there is no funder who will fund work like this. And, and so in our case, you know, we went to the National Institutes of Health and they fund a lot of research that we do. You wouldn't be surprised, right? We do cardiovascular research. NIH absolutely funds basic research in cardiovascular disease. It makes a ton of sense. We went to them and 
you know, said, well, let's put this to rest. You know, let's figure out how much benefit comes from nature, you know, for heart disease re reduction. And heart disease is the number one killer globally. You know, it'd be an important thing to know. And so, uh, you know, and then essentially their answer was, you know, we, you know, we think this is an ambitious project. You know, we, we're not going to pay for your, your drugs, your trees. <laughs> so, you know, we pay for your clinical study. We won't pay for your trees. The trees are a really trees and bushes are a really expensive part of this right and so um we ended up going to the nature conservancy and um you know th their guidance was very clear you know we like we like your project but we're not going to pay for you know you collecting blood and urine you know with the nature conservancy we only pay for trees and bushes so if you can imagine this project never would have happened if we couldn't have put those two things together and that's why it never happens anywhere else in the world so it's it's um, you know there, we don't have a society that knows how to and is ready to pay for uh, this work right to to really understand because because the goal isn't to do a bunch of research the goal is to as quickly as possible figure out where the benefit is you know we like to use the term dose response like at some level we'd like to know you know how much vegetation how far from your house confers a benefit and you know that's how much you know we should be planning for and that's how much we should care to you know have as a society but you know you you have to take this step first and you know when it, when nobody can figure out how to how to pay for it it doesn't get done and so these other cities they all scratch their heads like we don't know how you did that and i'm like well you know you just have to really work at it right i mean it's, it was a lot of it was a lot of essentially you know proposals and negotiations with different sectors of society in order make this project come together well and, I, and i'm absolutely thrilled to hear that louisville for for the first time in in a while seems like they are on a the groundbreaking floor of a, a development of a study like this and it, it the type of collaboration you're talking about at least from my perspective seems more unusual and and clearly it is because you know you, like you said it can't, well, my, biggest it, anywhere right, else. my biggest fear is it'll never happen again right that is my single biggest fear <laughs> right like so when we can all do high fives in the hallway saying isn't it awesome that we pulled this off but like it is a disaster if this is the only time it ever happens right right so we need those other cities to figure out how to do this i mean i desperately need pittsburgh and phoenix and i mean there's, there's i mean there are communities that really want to do this and i really want them to have the same kind of rabid appetite you know that we had to try to figure out how to get it done i mean isn't that the core principle of of the scientific method right is that it has to be able to be replicated <laughs> absolutely yeah i mean so one study won't won't be definitive as as you know right it, it's important it's it's definitely a big step up from all these associative studies but it's not going to be definitive there are going to be people who say well it only works in temperate climates it only works. i mean like mm -hmm. i mean we have, there are factors right that don't make it you know replicate in other places uh, logically and maybe there are adaptations for different uh eco regions you know in the world and and that's perfectly fine um but you know that means they all got to step up and sort of do, do their part even without the results of the study uh i know that this is a, a big leap but are you already starting to see things that you think that city and state governments can do to foster healthier environments and, and citizens for that matter? It's a really good question. I mean, I'm, it's hard when you're this close to the work where I am. Like, mm -hmm. So we, 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 of course, you know, we're trying to be as dispassionate and objective as we need to be, right? We need to be dispassionate. Like, I'm prepared to find no benefit of all of this vegetation, right? Prepared for that. But at the same time, you know, the, the deeper you dig into all of these sort of what, what seem to the person on the street as common sense, right? You know, like, of course, a, a place that is less hardscape and <laughs> brutal and polluted and noisy, you know, of course, that's going to be a healthier place, right? And so, you know, on the surface of it, you know, you, you then get anxious, you say, you know, like, come on, you know, like, let's, let's, let's all update our urban planning playbooks, let's argue with public safety people about, you know, um, guidelines that were set up for an environment full of cars, right? Um, you know, and, and let's, uh, you know, let's really update this. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, I mean, we have to be, we have to be objective about it, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, you know, more and more, um, I guess, discovery or arrival at that conclusion, right, that it, that it, of course, is inherently logical 
you know, that we should have the right amount of nature in our own lives. And, you know, it'd be great if that value started to permeate society more broadly so that it's not all hanging on kind of, well, what did your study say? And was it significant at the 0.05 level or the 0.01 level, right? I mean, we don't want to, we, we hope it doesn't devolve to that. Right. So what, uh, with that said, and obviously I know you, you can't give too much in the specifics, um, but I, I look at our tree canopy poly, or our forest code in Louisville and in Audubon Park for that matter, um, where we look at now we're finally having tree replacement requirements in the right of way. So we're starting to gain some more, or add better policies, but we're still behind a lot of other cities when it comes to uh, commercial space, you know, not having... Uh, tree minimums for, you know, like yep. grocery store parking lots, or we're not having as harsh enough penalties or things for uh, deforestation of urban forests for green space development. What are specific policies? And do you think that this is going to enable any type of specific policy one way or the other? I mean, if you come back and get nothing from this study, or if you get the study and says that it has zero impact, is that potentially taking the wind out of the sails of people that are advocating for more tree uh, and green space development in the city? Well, and remember, we're only asking one question, right? So we're, we're asking the question, you know, does this vegetation, this forestry, all this, does it, does it really change our risk for cardiovascular disease? That's the only question we're asking. If you ask a different question, like, uh, will uh, will this vegetation cool the city? Will this vegetation capture storm water? Will this? I mean, we can have a long list of other things, right? That are potentially important to society, right? We're not we're not focused on those questions, and so you know, I think you made an earlier reference to Tree Louisville and, and other organizations. I mean, they, you know, I've seen the, the presentation, and it includes all of these other um, benefits of vegetation you know, that, uh, again, are out of scope for what we're doing. You know, we're not looking at urban heat islands and we're not looking at heat stress and, and things like that because we can really only have one endpoint. <laughs> and so we have our endpoint and we're credible on the on the topic of cardiovascular disease. So, you know, that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. So I, I, I don't see a scenario where, you know, if we had a non-finding, everybody says, well, you know, it was all a bunch of garbage. Let's pour more, you know, asphalt and concrete. Um, I think it might be, Okay, you know, like, I don't know what that health benefit is that we're seeing, but it wasn't this particular path, right? It wasn't the air pollution and, the, you know, vascular, you know, stiffness, you know, it, it's something else is under there, right? And maybe it was the social cohesion and maybe it was, I mean, like, you, you could just be left. And this is the beauty of science is there are lots of other things then, you know, that are probably worth looking at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we had to make a very compelling case, you know, for why we thought this was um, a primary benefit. And so, you know, I'm, we're, we're hoping we did enough homework that, you know, uh, that, that we'll be able to demonstrate this. So it's not, it's not a crapshoot, you know, it's not just flipping a coin. I wonder if this is going to work or not, but at the same time, you know, we have to be uh, ready for anything. I mean, certainly the pandemic has created um, a number of issues for the project that we don't want to measure the effect of covid right? right and vegetation right that wasn't the original proposal there's no research on what does a global pandemic do so we have to just sort of roll with the punches and so we're we're adjusting a project accordingly so that we can rebaseline and you know, make sure we have a clear understanding of what the role of vegetation is if this study does provide evidence that green space does impact citizens health is there a specific policy that you foresee that city government should undertake so, to further yeah. this i'm sorry to make you ask that question twice <laughs> so, no, um, no 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 i didn't yeah I no 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 no. Did. no yeah i think you did so here's the deal if you think about policy you know so so what's the what's the societal sort of problem or opportunity that the policy is addressing so from my perspective this is about health policy it's not about uh, you know, uh, building codes, not about transportation uh, codes and processes, planning. This is about health. And so the policies that are the nearest neighbors of this, in my mind, and others might come up with others, um, is our, our commitment as a society to treat drinking water, uh, to treat uh, sanitary sewage, and 
you know, our commitment to um, removing, you know, solid you know, uh, waste. Right? So, so, you know, we do that as a society for its health benefit, right? I mean, you know, some people might misunderstand, you know, this as, um, you know, aesthetics, like, well, we don't want garbage piling up in the streets and we don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't want garbage piling up in the streets. We don't want, you know, open pit sewers in our backyards because we know that disease comes immediately with that, right? And very, very nasty, awful disease that kills millions of people come with that. So we've made a commitment as a society to do these things. You know, we added vitamin D to milk. We added iodine to salt. Um, we did that for public health benefit, right? And so if we can demonstrate a health benefit, and everybody said, well, this is just something we got to do, and we do it, right? I mean, we passed laws, right, federal laws. There's local laws that have different levels of structure under those. Um, you know, so could we get to a place where essentially we say, gosh, that, you know, you're in an unhealthy place if there's, you know, not a, whatever, is there's a ratio, is it a, I mean, we'll come up with whatever is under it. But, you know, if we can establish that this is part of a fundamental human right, right, in the way that the right to clean drinking water, you know, is it's seen as a fundamental human right, and therefore is not dealt with at the level of the individual or the private sector on a, on a discretionary basis, you know, that's really where we need to, would need to go. Right. So that's what I mean. I mean, like federal policy that says, you know, you really need to have a certain amount of nature in the places we live. Well, uh, when it comes time to actually pitching uh, some kind of policy proposal, you know, derived from this study to different governments. Do you think your former role as a chief innovation officer will provide you any kind of benefit there? I mean, I'd like to think so. I mean, I would say it's unlikely that, um, you know, we come out of the study and we draft a policy. It's highly unlikely. What's What's potentially more likely is, you know, we get the interest of, um, I'm particularly drawn to the health insurers, um, you know, because, you know, they are the ones who are paying for all of this disease, right? And you could say, well, they're, they're, they're processing payments and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, if you look at, like, managed Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, there is risk that's being assumed by the insurers. And, um, and therefore, I think they might be vested. And this is my working theory. So uh, the, the former innovation officer in me would say, you know, let's make sure we don't have any wrong pocket problems. Right. So so let's make sure if the benefit is accruing to somebody that that party is in the conversation. And so, you know, it's one of my dreams around this project that we introduce the healthcare system to this work. Right. Because remember, they are the ones paying for this disease, because if you go the other way and you say, well, what are the sources of pollution and how do we regulate polluters and how do we change energy mix and all those kinds of things? You know, that's a different um, set of equations, right? Because the energy industry isn't paying for the health claims for people with heart disease. And so, you know, and I don't expect the public sector to just pick this up, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, because, again, they're not paying all these claims for all these strokes and heart attacks. You know, so, so, you know, I, I think uh, a lesson I learned a long time ago is, you know, you want to always try to solve for wrong pocket problems. Like, if the money is being saved, it needs to go into the pocket of the person who was spending the money. And if that's the public sector, it's the public sector. If it's the private sector, it's the private sector. And we really need to be clear about that. Absolutely. I, th I think that makes sense. So what then do you think that your former role as the chief innovation officer has helped you with this in this new role at all at the University of Louisville? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I mean, so, so the reason that um, I thought it all made sense to have this new organization at U of L was because of this special, you know, kind of we're a mid-sized American city, kind of in the middle of the country. And um, we are better for having this mix of a, a pretty well-connected, just a few degrees of freedom kind of city, right? You can hop around the city and you can get to people and, you know, get an audience and have a conversation. I mean, it's, it's remarkably easy to do that in the city. I learned that working for the mayor. 
Um, and it, it works really well for, every, you know, for, for lots of people and for the people it doesn't work for, we should, we should be working harder to make it work better for them too. But, you know, we're leaps ahead of big, big cities like Chicago or Atlanta or LA. I mean, you know, you couldn't get anything done in any of those cities ever if you tried, right? Because you can never talk to all the stakeholders, you know, they're all kind of, uh, hard to find and, you know, they're sort of cloistered in their own networks. So, so anyway, so, so a, we have this wonderful city that, you know, is pretty well connected. And so we can have, uh, we can have that conversation and then B, you know, this idea of having, um, you know, kind of an expertise and a learning environment in our backyard so that when we're trying to figure these things out, we don't know the answer for what kinds of cities we really need. We know the cities that we have, but, you know, maybe uh, maybe we now know new things and we should be thinking about cities differently. It's great to have a research university where you can ask these questions and do this work because you have people that, that know how to do that work. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I have a deep bias towards these uh, they're called town gown relationships. Right, The city of Pittsburgh without the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, you know, wouldn't today have Google and Apple and wouldn't have, uh, you know, Uber and I mean, you look at uh, self-driving cars, I mean, a significant amount of that technology came out of Carnegie Mellon. I mean, so it is because they could play in Pittsburgh. I mean, when I was growing up there, I mean, I saw autonomous vehicles driving around the streets, you know, in the 80s. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, they're clunky and they certainly weren't safe and there were lots of graduates <laughs> running around them so they didn't kill anybody. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, you could see how it made sense to, to, to be in a city like this. You know, and I view this city when I moved here. It was like, "Yep, this is kind of like Pittsburgh. But neighborhoods, we got a river. We got a football team. That's okay. You know, we'll we'll get there." <laughs> well, I certainly hope so, uh, Ted. This has been a, just an awesome conversation. But before we wrap it up, I've got just a couple things left to ask you. Uh, one, we want to give you a chance. Like, are there any projects that you or your institute are working on that you'd like to promote? Yeah. So. Um, so, so because our, our, our mission is, you know, the environment uh, writ large, um, so that's sort of any factors in your environment, we actually have a, a very large portfolio of work. Um, I just I want to highlight just a couple of things. You know, A, we are, um, for the American Heart Association and the FDA, we are a, a core institution focused on um, tobacco risk, um, and especially these days, e-cigarettes and vaping. So we're doing you know, really some of the, the most significant work in the country in that area. And so that'd be something that might surprise most Louisvillians. Like we are, we are all over, you know, what the, what the real risks are uh, for uh, vaping and e-cigarettes and other kinds of tobacco products. Um, you know, we also have um, a Superfund Research Center. And so, you know, Kentucky you know, is, uh, is famous for the Valley of the Drums, one of the first Superfund sites in the United States. Um, you know, our, our ongoing tensions with, you know, industrial polluters and, you know, what, what that's done to, uh, you know, health and safety of the American public. So we have a major uh, research uh, team, you know, working on that. We have a team that's focused on diabetes and obesity and uh, what we think of as cardiometabolic um, relationships, the, you know, the relationship between your metabolism and uh, vascular function. And so as we look at um, air pollution and diabetes and heart disease, you know, there are, are pretty well-established relationships. We think those are very interesting. Uh, we look at circadian rhythms <clears throat> and air pollution, um, you know, so it's, um, it's, it's a big portfolio. And then most recently during the pandemic, we focused on uh, immune function and uh, really, um, you know, sort of this intersection between, um, you know, kind of uh, good health and, um, and, you know, protection against, you know, pathogens. So we're, we're, we're we have an ambitious big scope. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, honestly, all of those things sound incredibly important. Yeah. When you talk about super fun sites throughout the state, uh, it, there's uh, too many, you know, it's nothing to be proud of, but I, right. I, I think that that's noble work. Uh, before we let you go, we ask all our guests this final question. If you had the power to change one policy in Louisville, just wave your hands and make it happen. What would it be? Oh, if I could change one policy, I, I would really focus on, um, uh, you know, the extent of our public transit system uh, outside of, you know, call it the Waterson Expressway. 
I love to hear that. I love yeah, to hear yeah. that. <laughs> well, you know, I think I think you know it'd be bold, it'd be controversial, but you know, it, it might do a, it might make it all work differently and better. You know, so yeah, that's one thing I'd, I'd love to see before I die. Oh, we love it. Well, I, Ted, it's been great having you on. I've loved having this conversation, and uh, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Thank you very much. Take it easy. We'll pick back up with our reaction segment after a word from our sponsor. Well, Luke, again, just hit after hit. Every episode, we have another good guest, another good interview. Uh, this one felt a little near and dear to my heart because of you know the green, the importance on greenscapes and the tree canopy in Louisville. Uh, I think Dr. Ted Smith is doing some great work with the University of Louisville. Uh, what stood out to you? Well, I mean, as you said, I think it's such a benefit to Louisville to be having this type of study conducted in our city. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it speaks to the quality of our medical school and like the the professionals, the medical professionals we have around town. Also, like the academics that are willing to engage and like analyzing the data. It's it's really, really interesting. And it's something that prior to getting ready for this interview, I did not understand some of the <laughs> horrible statistics around health in this region and even in our city specifically. Like our air quality is just outrageously poor, which I guess mm-hmm. with coal fire pl- power plants all over the state, that's not entirely shocking. But we also have too small of a tree canopy. We have too, you know, few green spaces, right? I mean, a, well, yeah. Fast <laughs> growing heat island, right? I mean, we already, we hit that before. So I'm sure that that all accumulates into the same data. It it, it does, I'm sure. But I, I don't know. It's just, uh, and we talk about cancer rates, you know, it's b- before talking to Dr. Smith, I was mortified at some of mm-hmm. some of the health outcomes surrounding people, you know, in this region. And I don't know, I think something that's going to analyze preventative policies that you could put in place that might have a tremendous health benefit. I think that's uh, that's invaluable. And I'm glad to see that studies like that are being conducted here. And I, like he mentioned, it's interesting because Louisville as a mid-sized city typically struggles, maybe like a lot of mid-sized cities do to compete on a, a larger national scale for a lot of projects, a lot of, you know, businesses, what have you. But the fact is being the midsize city, it's easier to connect. And so this is a project like Dr. Smith said that Louisville could pull off, but I'm not sure that larger cities, at least right now, until Louisville proves the validity of this project that larger cities could pull off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also, it, it's reassuring, you know, from like a health perspective th- that you have other cities that have already expressed an interest in like the type of work that, that they're mm-hmm. doing here. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that you and I are kind of tree nuts. Like we'd love to see any kind of policy that could yes. expand the canopy layer, expand green space throughout the city. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, on top of all of the other reasons I think we've talked about before, uh, the health benefits you know it's good to see something like that codified uh in in a a measurable manner that other people can try and replicate and you know it's just the the benefits of it are potentially you know myriad and i'm so excited that we were able to talk to dr smith today yeah and so speaking of potential codification uh i want to do something a little bit different that we haven't really done on this episode before on the show before and that is I want to say either we create a policy that depending on the results of this study, we can kind of present as a possible solution. So talking both one, if the result is it is a positive impact on health of the people in that area, what policy should we take from that? And then the converse, okay, it says it has no health benefit, what policy should we take from it? Yeah. All right. So to start, if we're going to say, if we just assume that these results come back, that there is some sort of, at the bare minimum, positive impact on health of the citizens that live within the areas that they added additional green space, 
there are policies that we can consider to further that. So for example, right now, as just kind of background, we do have, as of a few years ago, a new forest code that requires uh, tree replacement on right-of-way spaces. So that has been very, very big. And it depends on whether the city actually enforces that or not. Uh, we also have the lack of policies surrounding uh, parking to tree ratios in like the bigger parking lots and commercial spaces like Kroger, Walmart, whatever. Yeah. What do you mean is like rather than just one giant asphalt slab, having yeah. a couple little medians with some green space in the middle, like maybe, right. maybe a tree, they provide shade for some of that black asphalt that's going to soak up heat. And maybe put tree height requirements on those as well. So they're not just, the yeah. Tiny so it's not one. just a little sapling and <laughs> yes. it actually provides some cover. Yes. Yeah. Something that actually grows above, you know, eight feet. Yeah. Uh, probably that, that would make a difference. <laughs> Um, so that's one thing. And then we've, we've talked uh, again in the past about how, you know, maybe the, the current green space policies uh, and current urban forest policies are not as strict as they should be as far as people deforesting to put down new developments. The penalties don't necessarily match up with being able just to wipe it out and then pay the fine later rather than having to get permission to take down the trees and incorporate the forest into the development. So those are, are some backgrounds. Another one that's not as well known uh, that kind of plays into an idea of I've had for a while is kind of the foreclosure policy with the city. So yeah, tying in some of the abandoned land around here. Yeah. So Louisville Metro government has, you know, about 600 plus ish uh, lots across the city. And I think in the last budget session, they actually added money back to start maintaining them more properly where they actually cut the grass yeah. rather than letting it be 10 inches. So the space is more usable now. Uh, but they typically get those pol those lots from foreclosure sales, uh, such as, you know, when they put a lien on for taxes or other maintenance, you know, if, if there is too uh, tall a grass or there is some sort of maintenance uh, fee or building code violation, the city will typically put fines on and then eventually they put liens and, and potentially foreclose on the property. And so what happens is that typically goes to public auction, but versus other states like Ohio and Cincinnati, because of the laws there, have a specific carve out so that the city can take it directly rather than having it just have to go to public auction and the city have to purchase that property. Uh, I don't know if this is necessary for Louisville, um, allowing the city to get a little bit more of a direct route to get these abandoned homes and, and properties that have liens put on them. But it is a, an idea. But right now, since we have about 600, I yeah, don't know I that it's like necessary. have already got kind of a note, but I, I see what you're saying. I see. So it just depends, I think, going into the future. Yeah. Uh, if we have enough pro properties. And I'm not suggesting all 600 properties that Louisville currently has should be turned into, but what I'm suggesting is Louisville using a percentage of those lots that they get as pocket parks. Yeah. Just go in and, and I know it's more maintenance. I know it adds costs, but if this proves to have health benefits, we should start saying, okay, well, there was an abandoned lot here that was demolished because it was a condemned property. The city owns, the city shouldn't try and flip that property. They should try and plant trees, maybe do a small path or a bench or something. I mean, if you, even if you just do a circle of, of, of a circle path and plant a bunch of trees on a small lot in Germantown, people are going to walk around in a circle on that just to oh, be yeah. outside. Oh, there is, speaking of Germantown, there is a park in my neighborhood that cannot possibly be bigger than any of the single family uh, home lots in my yeah. I, it, it's tiny but it gets used all the time i mean I, it's it's yeah, well except for this winter you know when there's snow on the ground or, or yeah. especially during covid they you know they hang up the the swing sets but prior to all of that stuff I, you'd never walk by it and not see it used yeah and i think that's to me is the biggest potential um is that we have those properties available now again if there was a dearth of those properties, maybe the city needs to look and advocate to the state to, to get the policies changed so there's a carve out to potentially get more. But as of right now, they have enough properties. They're not really maintaining them to be useful spaces. Uh, 
Yeah, just overgrown. Yeah. A lot of them empty lots, some of them with kind of rundown, uh, inhabitable structures on them. But if they could partner with some nonprofit, Trees Louisville or something, to get trees planted in those parks, make them usable, maybe put an occasional swing or so in these small little pocket parks, that to me would be the biggest net benefit based on what works, what the potential positive results of this study could return. Absolutely. And I think if you're if you're doing it for the health benefit, then you would want these to be distributed kind of to match the population like across your city. You know, if there's like a proximity, uh, if proximity plays a factor in that dose response benefit that Dr. Smith was talking about, like where uh, how close you are to the green space is going to actually matter, then you would want them to be like diffuse, like throughout the city. Yeah. Well, but, and, but you know, when we had Cindy Sullivan on in our very first podcast episode, she talked about, she gave the example of, if you look at where the tree canopy is the strongest versus where the tree canopy is the weakest, you can just put the historical redlining map right over top of it. Uh, so yeah. the, the parts of the city that have been in particularly and, and disproportionately affected by previous policies those probably need to have the priority. Now, on the flip side of that, I think, which is the danger zone, is there's a lot of urbanists that want to have more and more uh, of those 15-minute cities, that want to have more and more density in particular. And by doing this, you're actually eliminating a single-family zoned Property. Yeah, you're taking a piece of property or, off of the market, basically yeah, turn it into a yeah, park. Yeah, yeah, and it could be single family zone. It could be an apartment complex or something. We, we don't know. It's all hypothetical, I yeah. guess. But that does prevent pre, uh, present a potential issue as far as maybe green gentrification, where you're just rising property value and decentralizing, so there's fewer properties, so all the value should start going up. And they're all living next to parks. So their their uh, standard of living or whatever the, the area around them is getting better because they're getting parks. So there is that concept of green gentrification, which is dangerous. But it if there are health benefits, I just don't see how you can't do that. Especially if you could make the policy more equitable across the city, because the city government would be the ones they would have the properties. Yeah, but you'd yeah. have to trust the government to to correctly place the park pocket parks throughout the city i mean i think they'd have to bring on you know a couple of a handful of experts at least to probably advise them on that type of thing but i i guarantee somebody from the study would probably be able to make out carve out the time to help the city fair, yeah, enough, fair uh, enough. assumption there but I, I there's a lot of people involved and i think that somebody would probably find the time absolutely so there like i said there would be obviously benefits and negatives to it but and there would be some specific areas that would have to be looked at, but it is just a concept. And again, it just all depends on what we get back from the study. Now on the flip side, what if the study comes back and says no benefit to people living in those greener areas whatsoever, no health benefits? Well, I'd say if you think just because we can't find a health benefit, we don't want to plant more trees, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Cause I think, I think, and we were discussing this before, uh, before the podcast, I think there's still, even if you can not find a, a direct correlative health benefit, uh, there is an economic, there's a biodiversity argument to be made for increasing green space all around the city. I think maybe just the distribution of those green spaces, you wouldn't need to necessarily prioritize it in the same way. The criteria would be different. If if you're doing it for economic or biodiversity reasons, you wouldn't necessarily need to cluster parks uh, wherever the populations uh, are, are the densest. You know, you could kind of uh, spread them out uh, for their economic benefits. So maybe, right. yeah. Well, I was just going to say, so like Barstown Road, people have been talking about taking the uh, uh, power lines that go along the street and either bury them or move them behind the commercial properties and then put a tree canopy all up and down our four and a half mile strip of businesses, storefront businesses. Exactly. And you and I have talked about that. I don't know if the lines necessarily need to be buried. I think yeah, you pointed out might, that you could probably put them just behind Barstown yeah, Road. Save a little bit of cost there. But. Yeah. Yeah. But no, uh, but in general, like the underlying idea of like greening Barstown Road, 
Not a bad idea. I think that that's great. I think you'd probably see an economic benefit. You'd probably see like an energy saving benefit for all the businesses along there if they're if they have you know glass storefronts and they they get to benefit from some of that shade. Yeah, it'd probably be a nice thing for them. But um, if they can make it more walkable, more desirable to be in that neighborhood, if it's yeah. you know a hot sunny day and people like to be outside but they don't want to be in the boiling sun, yeah, just it, baking. It just makes the areas more desirable. And so from an economic standpoint, maybe there could be a policy that uh, prioritizes or adds to the commercial zoning requirement. And, you know, like we talked about with the larger commercial properties with the giant parking lots like a Kroger or Walmart or whatever, having those requirements, but then also being stricter potentially in commercial districts about right-of-way space trees or saying that those trees on those right-of-ways in commercial districts have to be even higher or even taller or be planted more consistently, like maybe one every 30 feet or one every 15 feet or something to require a larger percentage of tree campies in those economic hubs if if we have no health benefits. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and again, to, to harp on this, the economic benefit, uh, I'm going to harken all the way back to the very first of that trees Louisville episode. We talked briefly about a, a study coming out of Vancouver uh, mm-hmm. that attempted to estimate the economic value that trees contributed to the city annually. And uh, pulling up some of the stats from that old one, they estimated that Small trees provided a $5 annual benefit. Medium-sized trees provided around a $22 benefit. And large trees uh, provided you know, around a $50 benefit annually to the cities that, that hosted them. And those numbers seem small. And admittedly, they are. But when you add them together, when you add in all of the trees throughout the city – it's no longer a small number. Yeah, I mean, you're talking a tremendous economic benefit. And I, I think, uh, you know, if for no other reason than the economics, it makes sense to, to green the city, you know, and it speaks nothing as to the biodiversity aspect of it. You know, it does a lot to cultivate native plants to, to try and give them a uh, new habitat, which is constantly being encroached on, which is constantly being polluted or, or you know deforested and so it, the the benefits are are really innumerable you know and that's even in a scenario when you anticipate that the study provides uh, no finding as to uh, whether or not there's a health benefit yeah so what what would be the biodiversity component that, that you just kind of alluded to uh, well that actually feeds perfectly into our white paper for this week, uh, which was titled Challenges to the Multifunctional Uses and Multifarious Benefits of Urban Green Spaces. Uh, It's a study of the biodiversity in a number of parks in the town of Manila in the Philippines. Uh, Manila is an interesting choice to conduct this study because it's famously one of the most densely populated urban areas in the world. Uh, Also, being an island nation, the Philippines in general is kind of uniquely threatened by habitat and species loss. Uh, As this, you know, big towns start to urbanize and grow, Jakarta, Manila, uh, they they tend to decimate the the natural habitats that that species rely on to uh, to grow and to to survive. Uh, The paper basically reaffirmed a number of the benefits that we've talked about uh, that, that you might. Uh, draw from incorporating green spe- green spaces in urban planning, and uh, it actually goes on to propose a plan to manage and develop greater biodiversity in the city. Uh, the paper notes a lot of the benefits that, like I said, we've already talked about uh, in previous episodes, things like air and water purification, water runoff prevention, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, and, and obviously provides, you know, like a place for recreation or you know hang out everybody likes to hang out in a park right uh but the one benefit that we may have mentioned but i don't think we've hit in in great enough detail the main focus of of this paper uh was the the benefit that these green spaces have for biodiversity you know they provide a place for native indigenous species sometimes even endangered or threatened species to to flourish in the space of urbanization uh and it, it was also noted that these parks provided a place to potentially like educate the public, you know, teach them about horticulture and then the value that the space is actually provided for them. You you could do this through uh, hosting events there or, or 
plaques put up throughout the the green spaces you know it's there's a number of ways to approach it but i think uh that's one thing that the city may be trying to do so they've noted all kinds of endangered and threatened species in these park systems throughout the the more affluent area and same the same holds true for the the less uh, green space, the, the district, the more economically depressed district. But uh, I guess the takeaway, one of the key takeaways is that by increasing the green space in these areas, they've been able to preserve habitat for all kinds of species that that might otherwise have gone extinct to this point. Mm-hmm. And um, they're able to provide an area to kind of educate the population. Like they've got, they've started to kind of implement a plan to put more informational stuff about how to preserve, you know, your own backyard, how to compost, how to uh, treat water runoff, you know, rainwater, things like that. And they've used these parks not only as a space to preserve biodiversity, but to educate their population about how to, you know, implement these ideas in their own, you know, whatever kind of land they may own, you know, and and they want to kind of uh, expand uh, this kind of land utilization to the masses so that more people understand how to use the land that they own. And uh, maybe they can provide an even greater benefit to the the biodiversity around them. Well, I think that's the thing, right? That the more you expand, the more you make it the popular thing, the more that other people will just jump on that. So yeah. if, if, if the city or nonprofits or whatever decide to make trees a priority and green spaces a priority then the masses may follow yeah and and another thing that they noted was the ability to grow kind of native uh edible plants Mm -hmm. you know in some of these parks and and uh export some of the knowledge of how to treat those specific uh those specific organisms so that you can maybe grow them uh on your own you know so it, it it gives you the ability to, you know, educate a population. And even if they, even if nobody else learns anything from it or implements any of the knowledge they may learn from it, you now have like spaces all around the city where they're growing fruits and vegetables that anybody can come up and pick. You know, it's, it's yeah. a nice thing, you know, and it, it decreases your dependence on, you know, more globalized uh, food markets, it allows you to maybe do some more local, regional uh, shopping or, or, or eating. Yeah, and I think the other aspect of this that is incredibly important is, like you said, the diversity of the plants is that, you know, one, you have, for example, the ash borer virus that has promulgated through Louisville and taken out a, a large percentage of trees. And if you have enough diversity, you're it's not going to necessarily affect you dramatically, but you have to have a robust, diverse plant system. And, and and the other aspect of it, too, you have to have this diversity, not just because of viruses, but in Kentucky, for example, Cindy Sullivan came on and told us that the climate is shifting so that our native plants aren't going to necessarily do as well as other types of plants that have been brought into this area that are now uh, acclimating better to the changing, even if it's slight, the changing climate. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think... Uh, that is definitely something to consider, but the resiliency, I, I want to hit on that a little bit more. I, I think it's harder for people to maybe picture, but if we choose as a society, as a city, as a region, whatever, to only cultivate a handful of plants and say there's only six or seven trees that we use to make up most of our canopy layer, like the tall trees that we like to see throughout our city. And then one of them gets hit by a virus or, or a parasite, like let's say the ash borer, and it starts just decimating our tree population. Mm-hmm. If we've become reliant on only a handful of trees that we use to, you know, beautify our entire city, and then one of them gets, you know, almost overnight wiped out by this plague, yeah. you know, you know, like boar, then I, we're going to dramatically notice the difference of losing that huge tree population. But if we if we choose to grow, you know, a wide variety of trees, you know, everything that's that's native to us, it's not going to, you know, cause some kind of, you know, I'm not trying to grow some poison sumac in my backyard, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, everything that, that's worthwhile, you know, that, that we can grow, uh, it's going to provide a lot of defense for the ecosystem, 
through that diversity. You know, if an ash war type uh, event occurs in a population that's well diversified, you'll just experience those losses much less because it's going to be spread. It's it's not going to affect as large a portion. Correct. You know. Well, and so I think just as a as a big takeaway here, like I don't want to say we're, we're no matter what we decided to like work and look the angle to craft green policy just for, as for as green spaces, but we no, kind of did certainly that. Not. But I, this whole discussion is not to diminish the uh, results of what is going to happen with this Green Heart Louisville survey and study. The idea here is we have to be prepared for what the results are going to show us. And if we aren't prepared for what the outcomes are going to be, we're we're going to be that much further behind in policy creation to follow the results of the study. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. But with that said, I'm very glad we had Dr. Ted Smith on today. And and unless you have anything else to add. No, it was great talking with him. and, And thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, take it easy. As always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us on Building This Community. If you'd like any more information, you can follow us on Twitter at buildingthiscom, C-O-M, or you can follow Andrew at Andrew J. Klump. And you can also follow Luke at LMP43. Definitely subscribe, and we look forward to talking to you guys next week.